right. Uh, good evening. This is uh, Voidir, a legal podcast with your host, Scott Reich. I am uh, here once again at my home because, frankly, I simply have not had time to do a podcast here in several days. And the reason being is that I have been in a first degree murder case uh, for the last two weeks. And unfortunately, yet again, I start another serious felony trial tomorrow. So in the meantime, I've been doing a very serious case. I've been preparing for this one. And now it is late at night, but I feel like I need to touch on a couple of things so that I don't lose my train of thought when it comes to the um, Chris Watts case that's currently uh, pending up in Weld County, uh, Colorado. But once again, um, my name is Scott Reich. Uh, this is uh, Voidir. It's a podcast of legal issues. I am your host, and I am a practicing attorney here in the state of Colorado, have been so for the last 24 years. So I think I know what I'm talking about since I've done this for the last uh, 24 years, primarily criminal defense. And the Christopher Watts case is obviously very sensational, just given the fact that Mr. Watts is alleged to have uh, killed his wife, and we will give him the presumption of innocence uh, until he is convicted in a court of law. And then also the other issue is going to be, uh, and hopefully uh, the news that I want to talk about this evening was the autopsy um, that is completed, and when are we, the public, going to get a copy of it? That's going to be interesting because we're going to try to find out, um, hopefully from that once it's released, and I think it will be released and we'll talk about in greater detail here, uh, that um, the daughters were killed. And um, obviously Mr. Watts alleged, and we've read in the warrantless, warrantless arrest for the affidavit for warrantless arrest, excuse me, that uh, Mr. Watts alleges that he observed his wife uh, kill one of the children uh, and or both, and then he went down, confronted her, and ultimately killed her, and then bur- burying all the bodies uh, from there at his uh, place of work, which was working in the oil field for a very um, prominent, well-respected oil company. So what's going to be interesting is, is can we determine when that autopsy report comes out, did Mr. Watts kill the children prior to his wife, Shanann, Shanann, uh, coming home from her business trip in the early morning hours of um, uh, of, uh, August uh, 13th when she arrived home. And so that's going to be very, very interesting to see on um, because – As you may recall, she arrived home on August 13th from her business trip, and uh, there's a fight regarding wanting a divorce, infidelity, things of that nature, but apparently everything is fine, but yet the neighbor's camera, security's cameras, show Mr. Watts what purports to be putting the bodies into his truck uh, early in the morning hours on the 13th, about 5.27 a.m. So... The podcast has been out for about a week. The video on YouTube should be up by the time this is put up on YouTube. And it is a comprehensive review talking through the timeline of the Christopher Watts events. So I will put the link below, but I encourage you to watch that because we really go through it. What I wanted to focus on here today is simply the autopsy. So as you may have heard in some of the news, the court was asked by the prosecution to limit the disclosure of the autopsy report of uh, Mr. Watts' uh, children and uh, Shannon, his wife. And the basically the district attorney gave a pretty uh, insignificant and insufficient uh, reason for asking that the autopsy not be produced to the public. And basically it said that it could have, uh, the 
prosecution alleged in their motion that it could affect the jury pool, and that was basically it. And um, what happened was that the the court read the statute, which apparently the district attorney should have read, uh, because the statute regarding the Disclosure of public records was pursuant to a particular uh, statute here in Colorado. Everybody uh, could have found it. The district attorney sh- certainly should have read it. Apparently, they may have read the head notes uh, to it, but they didn't actually read the uh, statute and what it requires. And what it requires is to have the coroner's office file basically a petition under the Colorado Open Records Act to see if anyone uh, has wanted this document. And basically the court said, I don't have any controversy because nobody has asked for it in the public yet. And therefore I can't really do anything about it. And so the district attorney said, or the court ordered the district attorney, Hey, why don't you have the coroner, uh, go back and, uh, file, uh, what needs to be done. And then maybe in this separate action, the court could take a position on whether it uh, is going to harm the uh, public good. And basically nothing has happened in this case. Um, and so the court ultimately determined that it lacked subject matter jurisdiction. There wasn't a case or controversy at this point because it wasn't the appropriate jurisdiction and the court wasn't to do that. And the court went on and said there's competing positions regarding whether the statutory procedure under CORA, which is the Colorado Open Records Act, provides an exclusive jurisdictional basis to resolve a dispute over public records access. And basically, the court cited some uh, case law for that proposition and basically said we need to construe a statute to limit jurisdiction only when the limitation um, is explicit. And so basically, the court concluded in its order dated October 12th, the criminal court lacks subject matter matter jurisdiction to consider the prosecution's motion to deny disclosure of public records pursuant to Colorado Revised Statute Section 24-72-4204, Paragraph 6, Subsection A. And therefore, the court said the motion is therefore denied. And it said in order to seek the relief requested, the custodian of the autopsy report shall be required to file a separate independent action in the Weld County District Court. So this was obviously on October 12th, and here we are. It is My watch is actually rolling over to the 16th as I speak right now, since it's about midnight here where I am. And so that's not uh, taken place yet. So the question then becomes, are the public, or is the public going to be allowed to get a copy of this, and when? Obviously, I'm very interested in it. I am perhaps will file a CORA request to see if I can get a copy of this so that we can bring it here uh, to you and discuss. And that autopsy report is going to be very telling. It's going to be hopefully provide some information. There's some things that the coroner's report is not going to be able to tell us. The exact moment of death, for example. They're only going to be able to give us a time frame. Um What's going to be really interesting is whether they're actually going to be able to determine the uh, manner of death. Obviously, we know it's going to be a homicide because it's a death caused by another person. So that's easy. It's not like it's a suicide or an accident or something along those lines. It's obviously a a, uh, homicide. It's a murder uh, is the the, uh, uh, basis for that. The question is going to see, are they going to be able to determine... The cause was it strangulation? Was there something other than that? What we've been able to glean from the information that we have uh, thus far, and I think that it's going to be interesting. And they may be able to tell based upon that autopsy whether, in fact, uh, there was strangulation. Um, I think we've talked about it before, particularly a case I've recently dealt with. There was a a, a hyoid bone uh, fractured from uh, right there in the neck, and that really uh, goes to show the amount of force that was used to to uh, uh, cause someone to basically 
stop breathing by my strangulation. And the interesting thing is one can pass out relatively fast uh, if they're being strangled to basically pass out. But to kill somebody, it really takes a long, long time to do that. When I mean long time, three to five minutes, that is literally the uh, epitome of uh, after deliberation because you're actually sitting there holding somebody's neck and you know, they're more than likely struggling and looking at you. And this is allegedly Mr. Watts' uh, wife and his children that uh, he's accused of killing. So it's going to be able to be interesting to see whether there's anything from that autopsy report that completely contradicts uh, the statement that Mr. Watts gave to the uh, Frederick Police Department, whereby he stated that the children were killed by uh, the mother, Shannon. And so that's going to be very telling in this particular case. The people right now are up to, my goodness, looking at the motions that they filed in this case. Uh, geez, the plaintiffs, I'm sorry, the defense has filed at least 37, 38, 38 motions plus the government's responses. And most of them, there's a few court orders. Um, the, regarding most of these, most of these are preliminary motions hearings, but the defense is definitely uh, keeping the prosecution working on this particular case. And another thing I find rather interesting in this particular matter is, my gosh, when the prosecution messed up the filing, uh, uh, the, the messed up the procedure for the filing to limit the access of the autopsy report, it really makes you wonder, are these people, these district attorneys, they're very nice, they're very competent, but are they in over their heads? It makes you think, if they can screw up this, a relatively easy procedural matter, what else can they screw up? What else have they screwed up, if anything? Could this guy, Christopher Watts, Walk? Are you kidding me? Who knows? And as we can see from Judge Kopkow's, uh orders in this particular case, he is a stickler for the law, a plain reading of the law, and basically said, hey, prosecution, I understand what you're trying to do. I appreciate what you're trying to do, but procedurally, you messed it up completely, and you can't really bring this motion. So... If there is an issue where, let's say, for example, evidence was obtained illegally, let's say uh, police pressured Mr. Watts to go into the house to search, maybe there really wasn't consent, um, maybe the statement that he made was uh, not obca- obtained um, in compliance with Miranda or if there's any force or threats or anything of that nature, uh, there is well any kind of psychological coercion, it uh, it could be interesting to see. Uh, we've got a very strong judge who's not going to be bullied by any particular side, the prosecution or the defense, as we've seen by this order. And so it could be interesting. If there are legitimate legal issues, this judge will more than likely give it to the defense, um, and not as a gift, but because they're entitled to it. If the prosecution messed up, as we've seen they can do quite easily already, then uh, you know the defense will try to exploit that. Uh, there's some really good case law regarding psychological coercion in the state of Colorado. You know, the prosecution, the investigators cannot promise things that are out of their control, so to speak. And it'll be very, very interesting to see what comes of it. I look forward to continually checking the motions that are being filed. And I will try to put a link to this as well so that you all can see a copy of all of the motions that are being filed um, additionally regarding that. Uh, the other thing is that the uh, prosecution filed a motion for non-testimonial identification. That's fingerprints, photographs of the hands, uh, fingerprint, palm prints, footprints, uh, photographs of the defendant. So... Uh, Pursuant to Colorado Rules of Criminal Procedure 41.1, uh, they, the prosecution asked for that. There's no uh, expectation of privacy, and therefore the uh, 
Uh, people are entitled to that. That can include DNA evidence as well. And the prosecution is going to want that DNA evidence because they're going to want a clean uh, buckle swab uh, from Mr. Watts. They're going to literally take in, it looks like a couple of big Q-tips. They go in there, rub it on the inside of his mouth. They put it back in the little package and they seal it up and send it off to the lab. So that uh, has also been granted. And so it's going to be interesting to see what the... Uh, prosecution wants. Obviously, the buckle swabs, they want that for the DNA, but in his own house, of course, his DNA is going to be there. Photographs of his hands, they're probably going to try to see and determine if there's any injuries to any of the children or to his wife as to whether maybe his hands could have done that. Um, finger, palm, footprints, uh, things like that, uh, anything around the scene. They want to see what he was wearing, uh, his soles that were were there, uh, his feet, anything along those lines, and obviously photographs of him to see if there's any injuries or anything that would give them a clue as to how exactly uh, this crime uh, is alleged to have taken place. So it's going to be interesting. We've got um, hopefully the the uh, autopsy report. We should be able to have that here in hopefully in the next uh, few weeks if uh, the court does not uh, deny uh, access to this. Frankly, I think it'll be released. I don't think it's going to taint this case uh, by or the potential jury pool in any way. And frankly, there's a remedy for that. It's simply called change of venue. We are going to get to see the uh, preliminary hearing. It's actually set for a status conference here in a couple of weeks in uh, November. And so that will be interesting to see as well, whether the defense asks for more time and how much more time they request and whether uh, the court's going to grant them an indefinite amount of time to do the uh, preliminary hearing. My guess is the date certain will be set. And then we'll also be able to track the case by the filings uh, in this case um, because that's public information and we're allowed to see it. We're allowed to see what the, pro- the plaintiffs, I'm sorry, the uh, uh, prosecution's motions are with their filing. But more interestingly is what are the defense filings and whether they're going to attempt to try to keep them under seal to see if it's going to taint anything um, in this case. Um, it's going to be interesting. That's where literally the nuts and bolts of the case uh, come down is motions hearings. That's going to determine any legal issues, what evidence comes in, what doesn't, if the police acted appropriately, if there's anything that needs to be suppressed. There's already been several issues re- in this case regarding the prosecution making statements to the press that shouldn't be made. And, um, you know, the court has granted uh, permission for the press to obviously be here in this case. And this is going to be a case where I think we've already seen that it is not going to be a quick 30 second blurb on the evening news. And that's the rest of the case that you will get. Uh, this is going to be followed all the way through. So, ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate you listening. Please uh, go to iTunes. You can uh, download the podcast, uh, Voir Dire, a law blog. It's available on Spotify, or you can go to um, the podcast website, which is uh, currently at voidir.libsyn.com. You can also follow us on YouTube at scottreich.com, Facebook, and Instagram under Voir Dire. And we will continue to follow this and keep you up to date and try to be more um, certain as far as getting the date out here, no less than once a week. We think we've got our technical and production issues resolved so that we can do that because, frankly, this is interesting. People love to talk about these types of situations. Even though it's what I do on a daily basis, it is interesting in this particular case, and, frankly, it's kind of nice not being the one having to um, represent the uh, person accused of simply providing commentary on it. So I appreciate you watching. Please um, continue to uh, tune in. Tune in If you like it, uh, the vlog, please subscribe. If you like what we put on YouTube, um, like it, subscribe, leave a comment, and we look forward to seeing you again as quickly as possible and leave those comments.